gentlemen, uh, welcome back to the Majestica Simpkin School of Human Rights. Of course, that was another wonderful lead-in uh, from another jazz performance here at Grow. Um, and I always love those clips because it looks like uh, Robert Smalls has a front row seat every single time. So I always appreciate that part of the uh, the background. But um, today we're going to really get into the Jim Crow era here in South Carolina, uh, a time period. Okay. Was that yesterday? We're going to go all the way back to yesterday. Uh, oh, don't get me started. Um, but I, I think this this period is really important. I think a lot of folks, of course, emphasize the Reconstruction era in South Carolina, and with good reason. A lot of people emphasize the Civil Rights Movement in South Carolina, and with good reason. But you really have to understand what's going on in the state with the Jim Crow era as well in order to have a firm appreciation for both how much was lost after Reconstruction and how much is being fought for during and after the Jim Crow period. Of course, both Reconstruction and the Jim Crow era are still with us even in 2024 in ways that are both very easy, easy to measure and ways that are very difficult for us to totally comprehend. So we're gonna go ahead and get started, but not with the people you think we normally start with when talking about Jim Crow segregation. Now, typically, when we talk about the Jim Crow era and the fall of Reconstruction, we tend to narrate the story as the following. Slavery ends in 1865. By 1869, South Carolina has a new constitution in place has a majority Black state legislature, has Black Americans in the position of power and prominence across the state, and then this all comes to a sudden and dramatic end by 1877. But as I said last week at the end of class, the story's not quite so simple as that. In fact, the story in South Carolina is perhaps more complicated here than it was in any other Southern state. So I'd like to introduce you to two historic friends of mine, at least. Um, and as a historian, I can say that most of my friends are, in fact, actually dead. But I digress. One of those individuals is someone that we don't really talk enough about in South Carolina history. And that is George W. Murray. This gentleman was actually the last Republican congressman from South Carolina until the late 20th century. He was also the last Black congressman from this state until James Clyburn went to Congress in 1992. Now, Murray's ascent and descent in South Carolina politics tells a story of the post-Reconstruction era that really complicates how we think about that particular time period. Murray goes to Congress in the 1890s, not the 1860s or 1870s. And to get to Congress, Murray actually defeats in a Republican Party primary in the 1890s, Thomas E. Miller, this gentleman you see here. Now, most South Carolinians know Miller more so for the fact that he was the first president who became known as South Carolina State University in 1896. But in 1892, Miller and Murray were adversaries within the Republican Party uh, specifically within the low country portion of that particular party. Now, both Miller and Murray were Republican politicians at a time when most of the South was very much solidly Democratic, uh, thanks to various voting rights initiatives to restrict the right to vote and so forth. But the presence of Murray and Miller in Congress in 1890 shows that uh, Black mm -hmm. power in South Carolina had not come to a complete and utter end after Reconstruction, but it was under siege. And of course, the Constitution of 1895, which we'll talk more about in a second, was really the final death blow to Black voting power in the state for several generations. Also, I, I can't help but note the fact that uh, one of the reasons Miller becomes the first president of SC State is that he was very aggressive and pushing for the creation of a Black, or in the parlance of the time, a Negro land grant institution. And some of you may know, some of you may not know, that uh, my current employer, Clapton University, 
once owned the land on which SC State currently resides. To make a very long story short, uh, that particular parcel of land was separated from Claflin by the state government to create South Carolina State University. However, what is also worth noting is that many Black South Carolinians like Thomas Miller felt that SC State was an important and indeed necessary school to have. There was a feeling that institutions like Claflin, albeit open to Black Americans, albeit working to help Black Americans achieve great things, were not seen as quote unquote Black institutions. SC State, on the other hand, being a public land grant institution, was seen as being one that could be run by Black Americans. Um, despite this, of course, Miller's presidency at SC State was a very difficult one because of the continuous lack of funding from the state government and so forth, a problem which still plagues SC State and many other HBCUs to this very day. But the context in which both Murray and Miller rise to prominence in South Carolina cannot be divorced from the importance of this gentleman, Ben Tillman, who was governor of South Carolina at the beginning of the 1890s and by 1895 became one of the state's two senators to Washington, D.C. Now, we've talked a bit already about how Ben Tillman uh, rises to power in South Carolina, but it's worth talking about this again. One of the things that Ben Tillman was very good at doing was cultivating a voter base amongst white farmers in South Carolina. He presented himself very much as the tribune of the small farmer, what Thomas Jefferson would have called the yeoman farmer in South Carolina. This was really the, the backbone of his power in the state for decades. Um, at the same time, Tillman made enemies of the Charleston elite, uh, many of the educated folks in South Carolina, and of course, he was no friend of Black Americans as well. When Tillman goes to the Senate, however, uh, he once again witnesses the problem that many other prominent South Carolinians also have who are nationally prominent. You can be very popular in South Carolina, or you can be very popular nationally. You cannot be both at the same time. This was a problem for John C. Calhoun in the early 19th century. This would be a problem for James Burns and Strom Thurmond in the 20th century. But for Ben Tillman, it became a particularly acute problem in 1896. Um, we know Tillman best as a politician from South Carolina, but what's often forgotten is that in 1896, he was briefly discussed as a candidate for president for the Democratic Party. Yes, there was a moment in history where folks put Ben Tillman and the presidency in the same sentence. Um, however, Ben Tillman made a mistake. He gave a speech at the Democratic National Convention in 1896, and he quickly became discarded as a candidate for president. Uh, quite simply, Ben Tillman's brand of racism and vitriol was too much even for folks in the 1890s. And I often joke with friends of mine that you know somebody is really racist if they're saying in the 1890s, this guy is racist. <laughs> um, ben Tillman fits that particular definition and it deflates his, his national political career, but he remains important because of his presence in the United States Senate, uh, which we'll talk more about in just a moment. Now, Ben Tillman's time as both governor and senator from South Carolina coincides with a period in U.S. and world history where anti-Black racism is on the rise. And as I always say with history, context is always king, and that is especially true of the rise of Ben Tillman and the rise of Jim Crow segregation. Now, today, the 21st century, of course, as we all know, uh, the Supreme Court is the average citizen's best friend. It has not made any controversial decisions in the last five to 10 to 15 or 20 or 30 or 50 years. Uh, it has always been a nonpartisan, uh, trustworthy institution. All kidding aside, though, um, the Supreme Court will get involved in the issue of racism, white supremacy, 
in the 1890s, most notably in the Plessy v. Ferguson decision of 1896. Now, by 1896, governments across the South had begun rewriting their Reconstruction era constitutions to try to find ways to disenfranchise Black voters, uh, to weaken Black political and social power, and to find new ways to enshrine not just white supremacy, but also segregation at a local and statewide level. Plessy v. Ferguson essentially gave the South the final authority to keep running with these new laws, rules, and regulations. When the Supreme Court ruled that the idea of separate but equal in terms of facilities, in terms of schools, and so forth, was perfectly constitutional. Now, the case itself came to the Supreme Court because Homer Plessy, a man living in Louisiana who, based on eyewitness accounts, could have actually passed for white, uh, sued the railroads in Louisiana to say that discrimination on the railroads having colored and white cars, in his opinion, made no sense. It was unconstitutional. The Supreme Court ruled, actually, in our estimation, it is constitutional. As long as those facilities are equal, separate, but equal. Now, most white Southerners rejoiced at the decision, um, focusing more so on the separate than the equal part. As we'll see, that'll play out in the weeks to come, especially in the realm of education. But Plessy v. Ferguson, like many other Supreme Court decisions, was also symbolic of a larger sea change in American and world society. Again, this decision was rendered only 30 years after the beginning of Reconstruction, a period in which there was a lot of optimism, at least in the Northern United States and amongst Black Americans, about the future of race relations in the country. By the mid 1890s, most of the optimism had turned into fear and concern about the future of the country itself. But I would argue, before we get back to South Carolina, that Plessy v. Ferguson was not just indicative of, a, an, of an American problem with race, it was indicative of a worldwide problem of anti-Black racism. I'll show you a map here. This is a map of the continent of Africa around the same time as the Plessy v. Ferguson decision. Now, one of the key themes of this course, I would argue, is not just South Carolina's importance in domestic American politics, but also what the state and what its ideologies represent on a global scale as well. And this map really combines those two themes pretty nicely. On the one hand, the ideas of white supremacy growing in the late 19th century to justify European and American imperialism all over the world. And secondly, what that imperialism actually looks like as we're seeing the nations of Europe, especially Western Europe, the United States, and later on Japan, really entering into an imperial race to see who can dominate as much of the world as possible. By the turn of the 20th century, only the nations of Liberia and Ethiopia were independent of European rule and for many, they felt that this was the natural state of things, that Africa had every reason in the world to be dominated by European powers. Some of the arguments being used for imperialism in Africa and in Asia were arguments also being used for Jim Crow segregation in the US South. Again, Southern leaders were making connections between racism at home and racism abroad. And indeed, the United States would also, of course, enter its own era of imperialistic um, domination and control. Uh, of course, and on the North American continent, this was best exemplified by the conquering of various indigenous tribes in the West throughout the 19th century. But by 1900, American imperialism was also overseas in the Caribbean and the Pacific, thanks to the Spanish-American War. Now, I think most of us have heard the phrase, remember the Maine, the destruction of the USS Maine in 1898 was used as a pretext for 
American intervention in Cuba. Now, by the late 1890s, um, press reports in the United States were talking about the Cuban War of Independence and portraying it as a war between a band of plucky rebels versus the Spanish government in Madrid. There were accusations of atrocities. There was concern amongst Americans of how the Cubans were being treated. Um, but in reality, most American leaders like President William McKinley and many others were deeply interested in taking from the Spanish empire what the Spanish once held. Places like Puerto Rico, for example, in the Caribbean, or the Philippines in the Pacific Ocean. Spanish-American War allowed the US to defeat Spain and to take newly acquired territories overseas. In fact, if you were a young school child going to a US school around 1900 or thereabouts, you came into a classroom and you looked at an American map, the map of the United States would have included Puerto Rico and the Philippines. Uh, they were treated as not just conquered territory, but as part of the United States and as really trophies of a newfound sense of American confidence on the international front. And again, maps like this that were printed during the war uh, really showcased how Americans were thinking about the Spanish-American War uh, and how important it was to them to win this war to show America as a major global power. Also, it's worth noting that if you go to the State House grounds today, uh, the Spanish-American War has a prominent place on the State House grounds. Several of the memorials there are dedicated to the war with Spain. Uh, in particular, there is one monument there that used to be there. And then this, the marker now says it was melted down to help build weapons during World War II, right? So again, even though South Carolina only sends about a thousand troops to fight in the Spanish-American War, the state of South Carolina really embraces the war like most Americans did in 1898. Uh, the great irony of all this, though, is that Ben Tillman, serving in the Senate at this time, is a staunch supporter of the war, but is actually deeply opposed to taking the Philippines or Puerto Rico. His reasoning was very simple. He felt that the United States did not need to absorb any more colored peoples into their republic. His argument was South Carolina's reconstruction history showed that people of color could not govern themselves and were not worthy parts of democracy. So he felt that the Philippines and Puerto Rico and Cuba should not, could not be absorbed into a, a new American empire. Tillman's racism actually made him an anti-imperialist. So this is a situation that Americans find themselves in by 1900, where the country is becoming a great power, but the violence that's being used to acquire territory overseas is also violence that is affecting American citizens directly. Of course, what I'm referring to is the problem of lynching that is very prevalent at this time too. So I'd like to introduce all of you this evening to the family of Fraser Baker. Uh, now, Fraser Baker is not pictured in this photograph because by the time it was taken, he had been shot and killed by a mob in Lake City, South Carolina. Now, Fraser Baker was a postman. Uh, he worked for the United States Postal Service in South Carolina at a time when Republicans, when they were in power in Washington, D.C., would try to give some patronage jobs and positions to Black people throughout the South as a reward for their support of the Republican Party during and after Reconstruction. <laughs> now, by all accounts, Fraser Baker was a, a good postman, but his only mistake was being Black in Lake City. Most of the white citizens of Lake City hated having a Black postman to deliver their mail. Uh, things, in fact, became so bad, they actually burned down the post office there, uh, as opposed to receiving the mail from a Black person. Fraser Baker decided to take matters into his own hands and move the postal service in his town into his own house to make sure the mail was still delivered 
despite the fact that the residents there hated having a black postman. Mr. Baker sent letters to Washington, D.C., including the President William McKinley himself, warning the president that he was under severe threat in Lake City and that he was not sure he could perform his duties as a postman due to the threat of violence. Eventually, middle of the night in 1897, particular day that year, Fraser Baker and his family woke up to smoke in their house. They realized it was on fire. Baker sent one of his sons to get help. The moment his son opened the door, a hell of gunfire greeted him. Now his son miraculously was unhurt, but his two-year-old daughter, Julia, was shot and killed in the barrage. After this, Fraser himself ran out to try to find some way to get past the mob. He was also shot and killed. The rest of his family, the women and young boys you see here in this photograph, they escaped out the back of the house and hid in a field behind the house for the rest of the night. They would eventually hide for three days in Lake City before ultimately escaping to Massachusetts, where they spent the rest of their lives. Now, normally with the story of lynching, we don't really hear much about local or state or federal authorities responding to lynching with any sort of investigation. But this was different because Fraser Baker was a federal employee. President McKinley promised that the government would investigate the crime, that the perpetrators of this heinous act would be brought to justice. Newspapers across the country, in fact, talked about the brutality of this attack on the Baker family. Even newspapers in South Carolina condemned the attack stunned and horrified by the fact that Postman and his daughter were shot and killed. Unfortunately, the investigation went nowhere. They were unable to figure out who the perpetrators actually were because, of course, no one came forward to identify them. No one came forward to say these were the men who actually did it. Instead, a federal employee was shot and killed in South Carolina. And the men who did it were never brought to justice. As it is, this was an exception to the rule of lynching in the 1890s. Now, last class, talking about the fall of Reconstruction and the implementation of the Mississippi Plan, we talked a great deal about how violence was used to really destroy reconstruction governments across the South. But now violence would also be used to keep those post reconstruction governments going and to keep black men and women, quote unquote, in their place. And by the way, if you ever go to Lake City, this is the marker about the lynching of Fraser Baker that is still there today. Um, again, the actual event caught national attention. It actually competed for headlines with the destruction of USS Maine in 1898. This is how big of a deal it was. But again, what you're seeing also is that the federal government is increasingly reluctant to get involved in these outrages in the South. We, a few weeks ago, had Fergus Borwich join us, talk about his book, Clan War. And you see President Ulysses Grant vigorously prosecute the Ku Klux Klan in the South. 20 years later, uh, there is very little appetite amongst even Republicans to try to go after some of these more heinous crimes in the Deep South. Some numbers for the class about lynching. And these numbers are being revised now because we're having to ask more questions about what properly defines a lynching, how many lynchings have gone unreported, uh, this doesn't include, of course, thousands of Black Americans who simply disappeared or were murdered in broad daylight or were kidnapped and, and put in the convict leasing, all these things. But when we're talking about lynchings, we're talking about the most heinous and most visceral example of white supremacy in the South and across the country during the Jim Crow era. 
Now, we believe approximately 4,743 people were lynched um, across the United States between the years 1882 to 1968. Um, of those, we believe between 3,400 to 4,000 were African Americans, so the vast majority. In South Carolina, we know of at least 156 African Americans who were lynched in this state during that time period. The state of Mississippi, by the way, leads the way with the highest number of lynchings at at least 539. Now you might be thinking to yourselves, well, these, these are all terrible statistics. These are terrible things to know about, but you know, 4,000 people over that long a time span doesn't sound like that big of a deal, but the actual lynching itself, the killing of a black man or woman through hanging, through shooting, through mutilation, so on and so forth, was just one part of the larger lynching process. Now I'm gonna apologize here in advance. I'm gonna show some imagery here that may be a bit disturbing. However, I think it's important to see what folks were seeing at the turn of the 20th century. Many lynchings were actually announced well in advance. Um, today, we think of them as these spontaneous events where a mob goes to, say, a, a county jail, snatches a Black person out, accuses them of sexual assault, and so on and so forth. No, in many cases, lynchings were actually public events. They were, this is not a joke, they were like picnics. Um, they would announce these things in advance in the local newspapers, as you can see here. Uh, this is from the Jackson, Mississippi Daily News in the middle. It says John Hart will, will be lynched by Ellisville mob. On the right is another one, Negro jerky at sullen, sullen as burning our nears. Again, these things were uh, announced in advance. They would say, come to this certain place at one o'clock in the afternoon. Bring your kids, bring your family. We'll be serving punch and food. But lynchings were not just about the individuals being killed. They were about making sure that Black Americans across the South understood that they could be killed at any time for any reason. And in fact, the lynching process did not end when the person was killed. Their deaths continued on in postcards. There is a museum, a, a Jim Crow museum in say the Michigan that has amongst its many artifacts from the Jim Crow era, dozens if not hundreds of postcards, just like this one, that Americans use to write letters on, to say wish you were here on one side, and on the other side was the picture of a lynch. The Postal Service was so horrified by these postcards, they eventually refused to send them through the mail, saying that they were grotesque and horrifying images of murder and mayhem and sex. But this image, I would submit to you, is not just disturbing because of the man who was being hung. What is equally disturbing are the faces of the folks doing the lynching. Take a look for a second. First off, you notice they are not hiding their faces. They are taking a photograph, having just committed a murder, and they are not only satisfied with it, some of them, including little kids, are actually smiling and laughing about it. W.E.B. Du Bois, the, the great scholar and historian and sociologist, when he lived in Atlanta, uh, was a witness to the aftermath of one of these lynchings, the lynching of Sam Hopes. And Du Bois had heard about the lynching. Uh, he had written a letter to the editor of the Atlanta Constitution that he was going to personally deliver to their offices the day after the lynching. So Dr. Du Bois is walking down the streets of Atlanta towards the offices of the Atlanta Constitution. And then he looks in a window of a general store 
Initially, he thinks he's looking at pieces of meat. And then he realizes, no, these were the fingers and toes and remains of Sam Hose, burned to a crisp and put on public display. Now, the Boas saw this, turned around, went back home, and realized he was going to have to do a lot more than just write about racism. So lynchings became an important part of Southern life in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, but this doesn't mean that nothing was being done in response to it. Uh, this is actually a map that was created by Ida B. Wells Barnett, uh, who was one of the leaders of the earliest efforts at an anti-lynching crusade in the United States in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. Um, her pamphlet, A Red Record, uh, not only gave evidence of what was going on with the lynchings, but actually argued the lynchings were not, I repeat, were not about bringing Black men to justice who had, who had committed sexual assault or rape against white women. What Ida B. Wells discovered was that most of the victims were actually Black men and women who were economically self-sufficient, who were seen as threats to their local communities because of their economic self-sufficiency. Now, this map you see here um, shows you a couple of things. The numbers in red or numbers in black are the numbers of lynchings in that particular time period from about 1889 uh, until 1921. So those are the figures in black. Oh, excuse me, those are the figures in red, excuse me. The figures in black are the number of congressmen in each state voting against an anti-lynching bill in Congress. So you see most of the South, virtually all their congressmen are voting against an anti-lynching bill. Uh, and in fact, you see that Ida B. Wells has drawn this red line. Uh, that's the Mason-Dixon line, basically, dividing the South from the rest of the country. Um, but she's showing you how many lynchings there were in each state, uh, and how bad it was. And if you look at the numbers, right, you look, there are lynchings outside the South too. Um, lynching was primarily a Southern problem, but it wasn't just a Southern problem. Out West, for example, Chinese immigrants were often the targets of lynching mobs. Um, in some parts of the country, the targets were indigenous peoples. Um, in New Orleans, there was an infamous lynching, mass lynching of several Italian immigrants in the 1890s. Um, so like most issues involving racism in American society, they target primarily Black Americans, but not just Black Americans. Sooner or later, what hurts Black Americans will hurt everyone else in some form or fashion. And so the crusade against lynching, amongst other things, takes up a lot of energy in the early 20th century amongst Black activists. Uh, but you're seeing a new kind of Black activism, largely because of the fact that the typical process of democracy seems to no longer work. Last week, we talked about the fall of Reconstruction. Today, I have to at least make a brief mention of the Wilmington insurrection, or Wilmington race riot, of 1898, where a biracial government in Wilmington, North Carolina, was overthrown by a coup d'etat. I mean, literally, as in they won their elections fair and square, and then white Democrats in the city stormed City Hall and forced the city government out of power. By the way, about three years ago, on January 6, 2021, when folks were talking about, we haven't seen anything in this country since, they were talking about Wilmington. That was the sense Wilmington, basically. Um, although, again, I would also argue that the Reconstruction era governments experienced similar coup d'etats and violent insurrections and the like. But Wilmington was the last big one. Uh, it was the last gasp of Black political power in North Carolina in 1898. But I don't want to make it seem as though everything is gloom and doom. Um, Black Americans in the South, in particular, are still trying to find ways to endure some of the worst excesses of Jim Crow segregation, the collapse of Reconstruction, um, 
the pushback on black voting rights and so forth. All across the South, you're, you're seeing the growth of new black institutions in education, in religion, so on. Um, this photograph is actually a photograph of the library at Claflin University circa 1899. And I will admit, yes, I am biased. I work at Claflin, so I'm going to use a Claflin photograph from that time period. However, there is a story behind the photo, too. And this is one reason I, I, I love using it. This isn't just a random photograph I got from Claflin's archives. This was actually taken from the Library of Congress's website. It was part of a collection of photographs assembled by W.E.B. Du Bois and his team of scholars who were trying to create what they called a Negro American exposition that would be displayed in Paris, France in 1900. The idea was very simple. They wanted to show how far Black life had come in the 35 years since emancipation and the end of the Civil War. And so they got photographs from Claflin, from Howard University, from Fisk, from Atlanta, from other parts of the South to show how far Black Americans had come despite the many obstacles they faced in that time period. And I must say, it is a bit humbling to realize, again, this is only 35 years since emancipation. Um, to put this in context, this is my own personal bias again showing here. I turned 38 this June. So this would have been literally within my entire lifetime if I've been alive in 1900. Also, if you're ever in Orangeburg, uh, that building is still on our campus today. It still exists. This is currently known as the Arthur Rose Museum, uh, and it is used to display art by Claflin students and Claflin alumni, but it began its life as our library. And the idea of education, of course, is becoming an increasingly important one for Black Americans at the turn of the 20th century. Now, by this time, of course, the great Black icon, Frederick Douglass, had passed away. And there was a debate amongst Black Americans about who would become the next great leader of the race at the end of the 19th century. And for most, the answer was actually quite obvious. Booker T. Washington, the founder of Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, uh, a man who was a prominent um, supporter of industrial education for Black Americans. Uh, he repeatedly argued in the 1890s and early 1900s that Black Americans had to find a way to become economically self-sufficient and then over time, they would reacquire the voting rights and other rights that were already um, afforded to them in the Constitution. Now, I want to make it clear. Like Usually when we talk about Booker T. Washington, it's more about he was an accommodationist. Uh, he didn't want to rock the boat on civil rights. That is true to an extent. His, I, his thinking was civil rights will come back down the road. We have to focus on economic empowerment first get ourselves situated economically before we can push for those rights. Ironically enough, Washington behind the scenes was actually paying for anti-lynching campaigns. He was actually funding um, Supreme Court cases, fighting for voting rights for Black Americans. But all those things he kept under wraps because, again, he was in Tuskegee, Alabama, uh, and he had every reason in the world to be concerned about security and safety not only himself, but his students at Tuskegee. On the other hand, scholars and activists like W.E.B. Du Bois were making a strong argument for fighting for political rights in the 1890s and going into the 20th century. Of course, in his collection of essays published in 1903 as Souls of Black Folk, uh, Du Bois not only makes a strong case against Washington, but makes a strong case for the liberal arts being important for Black Americans, uh, for the importance of voting rights, uh, even making arguments for what education should look like for Black Americans, for people in general. And I could do an entire lecture, and Christian Anderson, who's joining us today, knows this, about Du Bois' ideas on the liberal arts education. Um, his arguments for it, for the importance of knowing 
not just how to work or to find a job, but the importance of a deeper, well-rounded education still matter in 2024, especially as it comes to the current state of higher education today. But in South Carolina, debates about race and racism and what to do about civil rights and political rights uh, often included people such as Richard Carroll, who you see here on the screen. Now, Richard Carroll was a contemporary of both Washington and Du Bois. Uh, Carroll was born into slavery in the 1860s, but after the Civil War, after getting his freedom, eventually became a minister and became one of the most prominent Black Americans in South Carolina. Now, Carroll would become a supporter of Booker T. Washington's accommodationist strategy. And again, Carroll's thinking was, was quite clear. He, he's basically saying, we are in South Carolina. It's unclear if things will get better anytime soon. So for right now, what we should be doing is emphasizing security, emphasizing building up Black business, putting up Black wealth, and putting ourselves in a position to be indispensable to the state of South Carolina. And Carroll in many ways was a conduit to these larger trends and larger themes of black business, black self-help that were becoming prevalent ideologies in the early 20th century. As an example of this, in 1907, Richard Carroll um, sponsors the first Negro, Negro race convention in South Carolina, um, where they are trying to speak with one voice about race relations. Um, if you look at newspapers in the state of South Carolina in the early 20th century, like the state, for example, or Times and Democrat in Orangeburg, they often spoke very highly of Carroll because he was seen as being a Black person that white folk could actually talk to, who wouldn't rock the boat too much who would know the right things to say and when to say them, and would also know how to best present Black interests in a safe and accommodationist manner to white South Carolinians. <laughs> Later on in 1909, Carroll would actually invite Booker T. Washington to speak uh, at Claflin University. Uh, and as you can see here, it says here, he will be accompanied by Reverend Richard Carroll, who is well known in Orangeburg, right? Uh, Carroll was, was well-known throughout the state of South Carolina, uh, and he was instrumental in bringing Washington to Claflin to other speaking engagements in South Carolina. Uh, one of the reasons Washington is so well-remembered today is that he gave hundreds of speeches every single year. He was a popular speaker on the lecture circuit North and South. Uh, this is actually how he raised a lot of money for Tuskegee in the early years of the 20th century. But Black Americans in South Carolina are trying to find ways to create their own institutions. And again, with the Jim Crow era, what I want to emphasize this evening is not just the travails and tribulations that Black folk experienced, but also what they did in response to these issues. Now, a few weeks ago, when we viewed the Jessica Simpkins documentary, uh, we talked a bit about Matilda Evans, uh, a doctor right here in South Carolina, first Black female doctor in the state. Uh, she worked right here in Columbia, and she built up health care institutions for Black people in South Carolina. Now, again, when we think about healthcare in particular, we'll talk about this from Jessica Simpkins herself in a second. Healthcare is one of those things in, in history that we kind of downplay unless there's some sort of plague or pandemic to talk about here. But in the day-to-day -day lives of Black people in South Carolina, in Georgia, throughout the South and across the United States, one of the greatest indicators of anti-Black racism was the lack of access to adequate healthcare a lack of access that still affects Black Americans even to this day. Don't take my word for it. Look at the numbers, for example, for mortality rates amongst Black women, 
for rates of high blood pressure, diabetes, et cetera, amongst Black people across the country, and you'll see what I'm talking about. These things build up generation to generation, but Dr. Matilda Evans and others like her fought valiantly against these issues in the early and mid 20th century. Others who had their origins in the Palmetto State felt, however, it was time to take on white supremacy directly. One of those figures was Archibald Grimke, who became one of the founders of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or the NAACP, in 1909. Now, I know for some of those in the audience who are saying, wait a minute, wait, wait. Grimke, Grimke, I've heard that name before. Yes, you have heard that name before. And yes, it is the same family. The last time we talked about the Grimkes was the Grimke sisters who were white abolitionists um, in the uh, antebellum period up to the Civil War. Uh, Archibald Grimke was from the same family, uh, in fact, from the same plantation that uh, the Grimke sisters grew up on. And the Grimke family is one of those Southern families that has, you know, a, a, a white portion of the family and a not so white portion of the family. Um, and the Grimkes, I'm going to, this week I'm going to send out as one of my book recommendations, a book on the Grimke family that just came out last year. That is a great book about the Grimkes and how these, the two wings of the family go in very different directions. But Archibald Grimke was very much one of those individuals who held on to the ideals of the abolitionists and the radical Republicans from the mid 19th century. Uh, Archibald Grimke, spending much of his life in New England, held on to those traditions and really helped to, to really take those traditions and make them into something new for the NAACP in the 20th century as well. So again, South Carolina is producing all these people in the early 20th century, whether it's a Richard Carroll or an Archibald Grimke, who are on different parts of the spectrum when it comes to talking about civil rights and uh, political empowerment for everyone. Again, here's some photos of various members of the Grimke family. Again, see the Grimke sisters on the left over here. You see Archibald Grimke uh, up here. Um, again, I, I would argue the Grimke family is the quintessential American family for a variety of reasons. Now, if you are a Black person living in the South, turn of 20th century, chances are it seems that your life options are quite limited. Chances are it's actually quite likely you're living your life as a sharecropper, someone who is working soil owned by somebody else. You're hoping to break even with your crops. But year to year, you find you're falling deeper and deeper into debt and the dream of owning your own land, of working and living elsewhere seems further and further remote. If you're very unlucky, unlucky, you may be a Black person who has found himself or herself caught up in the convict leasing system of the South, where thousands of Black men and women every single year are charged with a wide array of crimes and are forced to do time in prison, often working on behalf of larger corporations. Today, of course, we have the plight of mass incarceration in the carceral state. A century ago, we had somewhat similar debates about convict leasing and what it was doing to Black men and women. But more and more Black Southerners are beginning to think about moving elsewhere. Now, this wasn't a new dream. In the Reconstruction period, for example, you have thousands of Black men and women moving to major Southern cities like Atlanta, Memphis, uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, and so forth. In the 1880s, you have the growth of the exodusters movement 
of black men and women from the South to the West. And we see that on the map here, as a matter of fact, uh, some of the blue lines going out West, um, going to Oklahoma and Kansas, most notably. But by the 19 teens, you're starting to see a growing number of black and white Southerners moving to the North or the West. Now, the Black migration is known to history as the Great Migration. It starts up around 1915 and actually continues all the way up to 1970, where millions of Black Americans move out of the South, <laughs> cities of the North and the West. Uh, what is important to note, however, because I, as a historian, I feel obligated to say this, when we teach this in class, we focus on the Great Migration. What we leave out, however, is that there are also millions of white Southerners as well making the same, same move. Um, some of the same reasons, in fact. Now, traditionally, when we discuss the Great Migration, we point out that Black people are leaving the South for greater opportunities up North to vote, to have better paying jobs, a better chance at life. All of that is true. But another key factor in the Great Migration can be summed up in two words, boll weevil. The boll weevil is this little bug that showed up in the South in the 19 teens and destroyed thousands upon thousands of acres of crops, most notably cotton. It ravaged Southern agriculture for decades to come. And it really forced a lot of folks to think to themselves, we've been growing crops for generations now, and the boll weevil has ruined everything for us. In fact, in the city of Enterprise, Alabama, there is a statue of a boll weevil. The reason being that the residents of Enterprise said that the boll weevil saved their city because it forced them to invest in heavy industry and to move away from agriculture. So there's a literal statue of a boll weevil there. Uh, we will build statues to everything. Um, but hey, at least not a Confederate soldier. It's an upgrade, mm -hmm. I would say. <laughs> Personal commentary aside. Um, what you're seeing in this map is how the Great Migration is beginning. Uh, and in particular, you want to take note of where folks are, are leaving from and where they're going to, right? So on the East Coast, for example, in Florida, Georgia, and the Carolinas, and Virginia, most Great Migration uh, individuals and families they are taking train and later bus routes from the south to the north that take them to Baltimore, Philadelphia, uh, New York, and Boston, for example. Um, if you live, say, in Alabama, Mississippi, you were gonna, you were gonna take routes of the Mississippi River to go to Chicago, um, Louisville, Kentucky, Cincinnati, Indianapolis, Cleveland, so forth. And if you live, say, in Texas or Louisiana, chances were you move out west to Oakland or Los Angeles, amongst other places. Much of this is being dictated by things such as railroad routes, bus routes, and so forth. And so you will have, for generations to come, Black families who have roots in the South, but also have relatives in the North, or vice versa. Uh, for example, my mother's side of the family, uh, she has relatives who were out of Ohio at one point, moved up there during the Great Migration, then came back south later on. In fact, uh, this even has a popular culture context too. Uh, if you ever watched the, the series Godfather of Harlem, it's a great series about the real life Harlem gangster Bumpy Johnson, who was around the 1950s and 60s. Uh, in the show, Bumpy Johnson, who lives in Harlem, has a front company called Gullah Movers because his folks were from South Carolina. And in fact, there's a whole subplot about some black Harlem Knights looking down on him because of his Gullah origins. So again, these things can manifest themselves in a wide variety of ways. Now, the early decades of the 20th century are a very interesting time period because there are so many debates going on in American society about who does and does not deserve true political and social equality. 
By the 19 teens, the fight for women's suffrage has taken a new and decisive turn. Now, I want to rewind back to last class for a second. Um, as we noted with the Reconstruction period, in the 1860s, there were already debates about granting women the right to vote on a federal level. However, even the most ardent radical Republicans acknowledged that it would have been difficult, if not impossible, for them to get the right to vote for both Black men and for women across the country at the same time. In fact, Frederick Douglass himself, who was an ardent supporter of women's rights, who was actually at the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848, argued during Reconstruction that while he was in favor of granting women the right to vote, he believed Black men needed it first as a form of self-defense in the South. The fact that Black men gained the right to vote and women did not, many historians argue, set back the suffrage movement for a generation or two. But by the early 20th century, the fight was still going on to get women the right to vote. Some states, especially those out West that already granted women the right to vote, uh, by 1917, New York State would also grant women the right to vote, showing some momentum for suffrage rights growing in the 19 teens. Still, the fight for women's right, women's right to vote was a fierce one. And within the suffrage movement, in fact, there were some deep divisions around region and especially race. Uh, in the South, for example, many champions of suffrage made the argument that suffrage for women was good because it would be limited to white women. And many white suffrage supporters in the South argue that if you grant white women the right to vote in the South, we could offset and destroy Black male voting power, or what was left of, it, left of it in the Deep South at that time. And this was not a national argument. Let me be very clear about this. The suffrage movement, like everything else at that time, was deeply divided over issues of race, issues of regionalism, and so forth. But in the South, many suffrage supporters made an argument based around race, saying that this would expand the idea of white racial solidarity amongst white men and women. On the other hand, many Black women who supported suffrage, individuals like Mary Church Terrell or Mary B. Talbert, they made an argument to Black men that if we get the right to vote, we can back you up at the ballot box. We can provide another layer of support and defense of civil rights at a time when it seemed as though all those defensive mechanisms were falling apart. Now, in South Carolina, the suffrage movement had a very prominent member uh, in its midst, and that was Anita Pollitzer. Uh, who became one of the most prominent Southern suffrage supporters in the early 20th century. Uh, now, Pollitzer was not just prominent on a state level. Uh, she eventually worked with individuals like Alice Paul on a national level to make sure that the 19th Amendment, the Amendment Granting Women the Right to Vote, was added to the Constitution. Uh, Pollitzer actually does a lot of work in galvanizing support for the amendment in the South, especially in Tennessee, which was the state that would deliver the decisive vote to make the amendment an official part of the U.S. Constitution in 1920. Uh, Pollitzer was one of the most um, ardent lobbyists for the amendment in Tennessee and really helped it get over the finish line. And I mean, it just barely got over the finish line in Tennessee. Most of the rest of the South, despite the efforts of Pulitzer and other Southern suffragists, never really backed suffrage uh, until much later in the 20th century. Uh, fun fact, when you have some time this evening or later this week, uh, take some time to look up when certain states ratified the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. Some of them wait a few decades after 1920 to formally ratify it. Um, again, how the Constitution works is that a certain number of states have to ratify it and, and so forth, and then it's officially done. But 
Other states can symbolically ratify it decades later. That happened a lot in the South in the latter half of the 20th century with the 19th Amendment. Now, one of the things about the fight for suffrage too is that it becomes really enmeshed with other national issues. Uh, for example, this is a photograph of pro-suffrage supporters at the White House in 1917 after the United States has formally entered the Great War against Germany and the Central Powers. And you see the signs are holding up. They're saying, Mr. President, that's Woodrow Wilson, how long must women wait for liberty? Mr. President, what will you do for women's suffrage? Right, they were using the war as a way to argue for suffrage, saying we're gonna fight for democracy abroad. We should have some of that at home as well. Now, there's also a really funny thing going on in the United States in the 20th century as well. There are, of course, debates about the race in American society, the role of gender, the suffrage movement. But in the aftermath of the collapse of the populist party and with the growth of socialist parties in Europe and elsewhere, in the U.S., you're seeing more and more prominent Americans asking some serious questions about class in American society. Now, one of the funny things about socialism in American history is that we tend to only talk about it either in the context of one of the two Red Scares, uh, either in 1919 or the late 1940s. But one of the reasons why those red scares were so intense, especially the first one in 1919, is that in the 19 teens, to perhaps your surprise, there was actually a vibrant socialist movement in the United States. There was a socialist party. Uh, in fact, Eugene Debs, man seeing the left here, actually won a million votes as their candidate for president in 1912. Uh, Hubert Harrison, the man on the right, becomes one of the most prominent Black socialists in the country. Uh, he's originally from the West Indies. He sets up shop in Harlem and very quickly becomes critical of the socialists and their, their stance on race and racism. Now, let me backtrack for a second. The Socialist Party in the US at that time was deeply divided over how to talk about racism. Many prominent socialists felt that if you solve the class question, if you solve the class issue, then everything else, including racism, will be solved along with it. However, Hubert Harrison argued that that wasn't true, uh, that he believed that you had to attack both issues of racism and class discrimination all at the same time. And in fact, this also made Harrison very critical of the NAACP. Uh, where the NAACP in its early years was a staunchly middle-class organization, Harrison argued that what the nation really needed was a grassroots working class coalition. And in fact, for much of Harrison's adult life, he gave speeches throughout the country, North and South, espousing these same ideas of pushing for not just class consciousness, but also thinking about how to combat racism through that class and racial consciousness. Um, Harrison was also a major critic of just about everyone else who was involved in civil rights. Uh, if you ever read his columns from the 19-teens and 20s, he attacks W.B. Du Bois, Marcus Garvey, a. Philip Randolph, uh, and just about every other prominent figure at that time, which is why you don't really hear about Harrison as much as you probably should. Uh, he managed to um, ruffle all the feathers in the 19-teens and 20s. 
But thinking about class isn't just for socialists. And in South Carolina, thinking about class included thinking about class via the, the prism of white supremacy. And this is where one of the good friends of our class comes into play. Coleman Bleeds, who was governor of South Carolina in the 19-teens and was one of the most prominent politicians in the state for a generation. Bleeds, in many ways, was the natural evolution of Ben Tillman and Tillmanism in South Carolina. But where Ben Tillman's base was farmers, Paul Bleeds' base was textile workers throughout the state of South Carolina poor working class whites who felt they were not being heard in the politics of South Carolina. Cole Blee's claimed to speak for them. Now, Blee's, as a politician, was one of the few politicians around during Ben Tillman's era who could actually be independent of Tillman. While he was an ally of Tillman at times, um, Blee's also forged his own path ahead. Uh, but this also meant that Blee's would be an inspiration to other politicians, most notably James Burns, who we'll talk a bit more about in just a moment. Now, Blee's, I, I joke at the start of class today that um, there are some figures in history whose racism is so bad at that time, people at the time pointed out. That was true of Ben Tillman, and this was doubly true of Paul Bleeds. Uh, in fact, I'm not really sure who would win a racism runoff between Bleeds and Tillman. It'd be a pretty close thing, but don't take my word for it. I want to show you something from the Crisis Magazine, which was, and still is, the official periodical of the NAACP. Now, this is, um, I just want to show you a column of theirs from 1913, so I'm gonna share my screen again. And by the way, for those curious folks in the class, if you go on Google Books, you can find most of the packages of the prices free and accessible to read online. So I'm gonna zoom in here. This is from the crisis, January, 1913. The two most talked of persons in the United States in the last month have been Mr. Cole Blees of South Carolina, and Mr. Jack Johnson of Chicago. Many bitter and sarcastic things have been said of both. And you're not familiar with Jack Johnson. He was a famous black boxer. He was the first black heavyweight champion of the world. Uh, and he was disliked uh, because he was a black heavyweight champion of the world. <laughs> but going back to Blee's for a second. Now, these are quotes from other newspapers across the country. Um, the New York Evening Post, commenting on Blee's defense of lynching, says that even, quote, if one could accept Governor Blee's position, in fairness to the colored people, he should have stated that of the 2,942 lynchings reported by the Chicago Tribune since 1885, there have been far more. But 24.7% have been of persons charged with the crime of rape. How many of those actually lynched for it were innocent? No one knows. 50% will not be a rash estimate. Now it goes on to say, we venture to prophecy that when this tendency goes a little further, even Governor Bleeds will find lynchings less praiseworthy. Now, however, the head of a Christian American commonwealth in solemn conclave applauds the mob and upholds its lust for blood. Never has a governor sucked so low. Even James Bardem in Mississippi sought to put down the mob. The New York Times adds, there are bleases in the North as well as in the South. It is tedious to get the right man by the winnowing processes of the law. The law's delay is often exasperating even, exasperating even to those who abide by it. But then he goes on to say, or Times goes on to say, the philosophy of getting the right man does not stop with Negroes, as the record of murderous Southern fiends and vinces. This is not an age for Blees and his life. The New York world called Blees the person who belongs to, quote, poor white trash. 
and that it is the rise of this class that has debauched the political South. Thus, the rise of the oppressed in the democracy is made the cause of such birth pains of democracy as Blease represents. So across the country, periodicals, newspapers are condemning Cole Blease for his defense of lynching, his defense of mob rule. But in South Carolina, Cole Blease is beloved for these very same things. At the same time, Blease finds ways to make enemies of the Charleston elite, of the educated in South Carolina. Um, he was often, how can I put this? While at times he made gestures to being pro-education, uh, he never supported compulsory attendance of schooling. Uh, he certainly had a hard time uh, supporting Black education in South Carolina and the like. Uh, in short, Cole Belize was an individual who, in his own time, was deeply disliked throughout the country. Uh, but for that very reason, arguably, he was beloved by many poor South Carolinians. Now, I can't help but tell the following story. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was lucky enough to attend a conference at Francis Marion University. It was the annual South Carolina Historical Association Conference. And in the final panel session of the day, I was able to attend a talk about Black South Carolinian history. Uh, Dr. Anderson was also in the room as well. And one of the speakers was talking about um, William Chappelle, who was the president of Allen University in the early 20th century, inviting Cole Belize to speak at Allen. I kid you not, the moment the speaker said that, the entire room, a room full of historians of South Carolina, groaned all at once, <laughs> hearing about Cole Belize speaking at Allen University. The fact that this man has that kind of impact a century later <laughs> should tell you how notorious Cole Belize became, not just in South Carolina, but throughout the entire country. Again, he was being condemned throughout most of the country for his pro-lynching stance. He said some incredibly heinous things as both governor of South Carolina and later on as a senator from South Carolina in Washington, D.C. But to most South Carolinians, it was simply the way things were in the Palmetto State. Now, well after Belize is left office, however, the United States enters the Great War in 1917. And by this time, you are starting to see a more radicalized Black population, um, not just in the Carolinas, but throughout the country. They are starting to think about new ways to fight for civil rights. <laughs> now, during the Great War itself, uh, Black regiments are raised throughout the country. For example, in South Carolina, you have this regiment, the 371st, uh, that eventually goes to France and fights in the Great War as part of the American war effort. Now, many Black Americans felt it was important to serve in the war to not just prove our patriotism, but to prove our worthiness for citizenship. The hope was, was that once the United States won the Great War and Black men returned home from combat, they would finally be granted the rights promised to them in the Constitution and that had not been upheld for generations at this point. W.E.B. Du Bois himself writes movingly in the crisis of supporting the, the war effort. And he talks about closing ranks and putting aside our special grievances. But soon Du Bois and many Black Americans would realize those promises would not be kept. Now I mentioned the NAACP being founded in 1909. By 1917, you're having chapters formed in Columbia and Charleston, South Carolina. Now, at that time, again, the NAACP is slowly growing 
Um, it's best known in the 19 teens for Du Bois's editorial position at the Crisis Magazine. But by the end of the 19 teens, the NAACP is going to find itself faced with some really serious issues in terms of dealing with civil rights. And those issues come to a head with the red summer of 1990. Now imagine, if you will, an America that is deeply divided politically, president unpopular, and oh, by the way, there are race riots across the country, and there is a pandemic of a flu-like virus. That was 1919 and also 2020. But many historians make comparisons between the two time periods for those very reasons. Um, the Red Summer was called the Red Summer because of the number of race riots across the United States happening in places as disparate as Chicago, Illinois, Washington, D.C., Elaine, Arkansas, and Charleston, South Carolina. But before I get into the Red Summer riots themselves, especially the one in Charleston, think about the context of this for a second. Number one, Black American soldiers are returning home, radicalized, having fought in the Great War, now demanding their equal rights coming back home. Number two, you have labor strikes all across the country as the United States is transitioning from a wartime economy back to a peacetime economy, the economy itself is in shambles. They're having a difficult time making that transition. A lot of folks are losing their jobs. A lot of folks are having a hard time finding housing in major cities as well. Third, perhaps most important, you have this little thing called the Russian Revolution going on at the same time. And while headlines across the country are initially dominated by the Great War, the flu, the influenza pandemic, and so forth, there is also a lot of attention being played to events in Russia. As the Bolsheviks under Vladimir Lenin are becoming, are coming closer and closer to acquiring power, there is a real fear in both Western Europe and the United States that this is merely the prelude to a worldwide revolution of communism that will not end in Russia, but will spread throughout the world like wildfire. And so many Americans concerned about uh, Black civil rights at home are often accusing those activists of being backed by communists from abroad, the original version of outside agitators, so to speak. But Americans are tying all these issues together. Uh, for example, the poster you see on the left here is actually a Russian poster. Uh, from the 1920s that is condemning the U.S. for its racism and its lack of equality for all. Uh, the Soviet Union would often talk about this on a global stage in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, throughout the entire Cold War. In fact. And on the right, you see a cartoon from the New York Evening Telegram. It says, has a leg, it has labor on it, it says strikes, walkouts, disorders, riots, Bolshevism, murders, chaos, question mark. There was a real feeling among some Americans in 1919, 1920, that the United States itself was on the verge of revolution. This is why, for example, J. Edgar Hoover is able to become head of the Bureau of Investigation and be given great powers to investigate these organizations. Now here's a map of the Red Summer riots. Again, as I mentioned before, they are taking place all across the country. Uh, the best known riot is actually in Chicago, Illinois, but the bloodiest one actually takes place in Elaine, Arkansas. As you see right here in the center of the map. Now this race, race riot was sparked by attempts by labor um, organizers to organize the sharecroppers in Elaine, Arkansas to demand better wages, demand better working conditions. This turned into a days long riot in which we, I mean, we're not quite sure, but we think the death toll was in the hundreds. 
by the time it was over. Thousands more Black residents of Elaine and the surrounding areas were forced to flee Arkansas, never to return for the rest of their lives. But I am sure, since this is a class about South Carolina, you have all taken notice of Charleston and its race riot in May of 1919. Now, by the way, this is a newspaper coverage headline of the riot in Atlanta, Arkansas. The idea was Black folk in the area were accused of planning to kill white people. They were just having labor meetings. That's all they were doing. And this led to a disastrous race riot in Elaine, Arkansas. Really a race, I shouldn't call them riots, they're more like race massacres. Yeah. But this is the headline from the New York Times covering the riot in Charleston. Uh, report six killed in sailor Negro riots. Other persons were wounded, eight severely in a race clash in Charleston, South Carolina. This was in May of 1919. Now, what we believe happened was that um, a group of U.S. Navy sailors were harassing Black men in Charleston. Um, this eventually led to one Black man to get his gun and fire it in the air to disperse a growing crowd of sailors and a growing white mob. Soon, many white Charlestonians were being, Charlestonians were being told that, in fact, that Black person had shot and killed a white man, and they went looking for revenge leading to a race riot in Charleston. Now this says six killed. We actually think the death toll is more like three or four. But what makes this race riot unique is that eventually the mayor of Charleston asked for help from the Marines to disperse the riot. And there is an actual investigation launched by the US Navy into what happened because it involved sailors. And the Navy finds that all the evidence we have indicates that actually our sailors were entirely at fault, that the Negroes in Charleston were simply defending themselves, that they had done nothing to deserve what happened to them during this race riot. But again, what you're seeing in Charleston throughout the country is a nation on edge when it comes to race relations, um, an edge that would, quite frankly, never really go away. You mentioned the Palmer records and the, the killing of Joe Hill and the smashing of the IWW, that, that other red scare that was about communism that was going on at the same time. All right. Let me go back a few slides for a second. Because we're, we're almost done. I do want to get to the Q&A. But your point is a really important one, right? Because... In a lot of ways, the 1910s are one of those periods of American history that gets to short shrift, right? I mentioned a moment ago that you have a, a powerful socialist movement in the U.S. at that time. You also have a growing labor movement as well, especially with the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World, uh, which was very much a counter to the AFL, the American Federation of Labor, which was seen by many workers, non-workers alike, as being more for craft labor and less interested in a mass labor movement. The IWW, however, was very much of the idea of trying to organize as many workers as they possibly could under one big union. Now, you have to put this, again, in context of the 1900s and 1910s. In the United States, since the 1870s, there have been various attempts at creating a mass labor movement. Most of them ended in failure. Many of them ended with violence, whether it was the 1877 Great Strike, uh, which almost crippled the entire country, but ultimately backfires on the striking workers. The 1886 Haymarket Riot in Chicago, uh, where uh, anarchists and labor activists are accused of throwing a bomb at the police in Chicago. This actually really damages the Knights of Labor, which was a mass labor organization of the late 19th century. Uh, such a mass group, in fact, they actually had, in some parts of the South, black and white workers 
organizing side by side. But these attempts at labor organized in the late 19th century were all dismantled, pushed back by both federal and state authorities. If we're being honest about this, the first president who was at least nominally an ally of labor was Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, up to that point, US presidents, most government officials were at best indifferent to labor, if not outright hostile most of the time. In the 19-teens, the IWW felt that it was on the cusp of building the kind of mass labor movement <coughs> that would speak with one voice for all American workers. But it faced tremendous pressure in the 19-teens from the federal government. Uh, it faced a lot of pressure, for example, by going on strike out west, having to deal with the militias out west that were you know, being used against them. And then the Great War doesn't help because it puts a severe clamp down on labor organizing as the nation is getting ready for war. You add to this the fact that during the Great War, and I, okay, during the Great War, you actually see the federal government doing what it usually does in wartime which is to say taking on new and expanded powers in the name of national security. So for example, the 19 teens saw the last gasp of foreign language press in the United States. There were dozens if not hundreds of newspapers, magazines in Yiddish, German, a whole bunch of languages from Europe, thanks to immigration, that were very popular in the United States. But during the Great War, because of national security concerns, those magazines were suppressed. So was the case with socialist publications like The Masses and others that were also suppressed by the federal government thanks to the need for national security measures. The government itself becomes more and more antsy about activist and activism. And by 1919, you have the launching of the Palmer Raids on activists throughout the country because of not just the Red Summer, but around that same time, you have a series of bombs mailed across the country that explode at the homes of prominent people. There's this idea that's going to lead to all-out revolution, and uh, Attorney General Palmer and his protege, J. Edgar Hoover, launch raids across the country uh, that really disrupt further activism and further radical labor organizing. Now, I'm talking about this now because next, this coming Sunday rather, we're gonna have a guest speaker, Carrie Taylor, talking a bit more about labor activism in the 30s and what it looks like in the South. But to understand why that's such a big deal, we have to first consider how labor activism was heavily disrupted a generation before that. Uh, in, in fact, you could make some comparisons between then and now with how labor activism in the 21st century is recovering from the losses it took in the late 20th century. Um, anything more to add to that, Brett? Or... Well, I just have a, a real soft spot in my heart for the industrial work of the world. Uh, Bro was a IWW shop for years, many years. And it was a time when the AFL, the AFL and the CIO didn't get together until 1954, and the AFL, the AFL didn't have black people in. And that when we started the print shop to grow in 1981, there none of the major unions would take a, a worker-owned, worker-collective drunk shop, which was ironic. I had an opportunity to talk to somebody that said they wouldn't do that and ask it that in your vision of labor being organized, you're always going to have to have bosses as opposed to the workers owning something. And he was puzzled, he pixelated and continued the conversation. But the IWW was was um, kind of like the original hippies with songs and, and an anti you know an anti authority attitude. And Joe Hill was a, a hero amongst many of us. And Joe was a labor organizer in Utah, and there, and he got framed for a murder he didn't commit, and they executed him. And Joe's last words were, "Get my body across the state line. I don't want to be caught dead in Utah." And they took him to Chicago and had a funeral with tens of thousands of people. It was a huge hero. 
And um, it was somewhere in the mid 80s that the IWW uh, office in Chicago, it was still there. It, it went away suddenly after the Palmer raids and all the killings and all, but it, it came back up uh, in the late 50s and 60s. And that the, um, the federal government had seized Joe Hill's ashes after Joe Hill was cremated uh, for being subversive. The Sedition Act was used by a lot of people. This is what Debbie, uh, Eugene Debs was in prison in Atlanta in 20, the 1920 election was when he was in prison. And he was charged with being opposed to the, with the war. And so that, that force was brought down very heavily to destroy organized labor. And we, we have to see that same force being used at certain times where they call anybody that's working for Black People's Liberation communist. It's a very very heavy, handy hammer to, you know, to hit people with. Mm -hmm. But we got um, in the mail a little vial of Joe Hill's ashes that were found in a postal, postal, some post office in Chicago in a file cabinet, and they had been intended to be mailed to all the IWW unions. And they, they had seized them for being seditious material. And we received Joe Hill's ashes uh, 40 years ago. He, he wanted to be buried in every state except Utah. <laughs> I am not going to make that's my, That was my little sidebar about it. No, I the I'm, movie Reds. Everybody knows. Oh, that's it's great. Four hours long, I think. Yes. Yeah. And um, what's the guy's name? Warren Beatty. Warren yeah. Beatty, which is yeah. fantastic. He, he, does, he, he portrays. Um, the, guys um, the really? journalist uh, uh, wrote uh, Tennessee shook, shook the World. Um, uh, hmm. Jack Reed. That's it. That's yeah, it. Jack Reed wasn't it? either Jack or John Reed. John. Anyway, it's, it's just a fantastic movie about that particular period. And he's a, 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 a reporter who's writing stories, he's leaning left, and it's very dramatic, and it's a, a good movie. No, it's it's a wonderful film. Uh, Red. Yeah. Dr. Green, before you proceed, I would like Brett to finish that story. So what happened to Joe Hill's ashes? Oh, I didn't want to go there, but well, <laughs> go ahead, Becky. <laughs> no, you you were there. Uh, okay. Uh, Merle, who some of you have seen Merle's picture, uh, Merle was like the keeper of the ashes. And um, Merle had them in a little um, stone box. It was like a little coffin. And we made great reverence to the ashes. And Merle died. And somebody stole the ashes, which we're probably pretty well convinced they thought were drugs. <laughs> so somewhere, somebody probably snorted the ashes. Oh, no, now, I, 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 I don't know how to take that. I'm just going to look at it as some kind of uh, ending. <laughs> You know, there is really no good way to transition. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to go ahead. Richard said he smoked his father's ashes. You know, what I really love about the Majestic School is that you never know what we'll talk about from class to class. So speaking of uh, speaking of, of help, let's get to the topic of help. Because I, I think some of us need some help and help right now. After hearing that story, um, I, I do want to finish up with a couple of things here that kind of set the stage for the next couple of classes. Number one, by this time, Majeska Simpkins is working in healthcare in South Carolina. I mentioned Matilda Evans a moment ago, um, but one of the things we have to think about in terms of civil and human rights is the centrality of healthcare to all those movements and. Simpkins, before she gets involved in her, her other better known initiatives, she is really trying to improve the health of Black Americans in South Carolina. As the Majeska Simpkins documentary made clear, this was largely a lonely battle for her. Like she was working with only, you know, a shoestring budget from South Carolina, but she was doing some important work in the community. It was an example of of organizing, community building, and community organizing. Um, so I really want to highlight that now um, because this will, again, play a role in some of the upcoming movements we're talking about. On the one hand, that is a positive, but the state of South Carolina's politics are also going to change dramatically in the 1930s as well. 
So I mentioned Cole Blees eventually goes to the United States Senate. Uh, he wins a Democratic primary election in 1924 against a young congressman named James Burns, also from South Carolina. Now, in that 1924 race, uh, Blees defeats Burns in the primary runoff by a percentage of 51% to 49%, a very close election. Most observers agree the main reason Burns lost was that in his earlier years, he had been Catholic. And when he ran for election against Blees, Blees' allies said that, oh, if you vote for James Burns, you're going to put a Catholic in the U.S. Senate from South Carolina, and we cannot have that happen. In the next election, 1930, Burns and Blees run against each other again. Now, Blees again wins the most votes in the general primary, but because no one got 50% of the vote, it went once again to a runoff. And this time, James Burns, who had spent the previous six years cultivating a base of support in the upstate amongst textile workers like Blees, is able to win narrowly against Cole Blees. Now, I only highlight this election because it's really a changing of the guard in South Carolina politics. We're going from Ben Tillman to Cole Blees, and now we're entering an era where James Burns becomes the most prominent politician from South Carolina. And one could make the argument that out of all of the builders <laughs> of South Carolina's unique brand of white supremacy in politics, John C. Calhoun, Ben Tillman, Cole Blees, James Burns, Strom Thurmond, Burns, perhaps, at least in a 20th century context, might be the most important one of all. Because Burns, as you're going to find out pretty soon, is going to have a major impact on the politics of South Carolina, the United States, and eventually the entire world. And Mr. Burns was a devotee and mentee of Ben Tillman. Right. That's, that, we'll, we'll, we, that line will become clearer as we move through the, the arrows here between the people that have been the most dominant political forces in South Carolina. So what we've learned tonight is the importance of Ben Tillman and to also be very suspicious of white pottery substances you've received in the mess. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so with uh, that being said, uh, time for questions. Let's see. Um, uh, <laughs> so any questions, either from folks in the room or folks in the chat? I, By the way, I, if you're watching this on YouTube later this week, I hope you didn't fast forward to like two minutes ago so you can understand that joke in context. <laughs> any questions at all? Yes. I don't have a question, but um, I did want to say a friend of mine organizes regular protest um, to take the Tillman statue down at the mm. state house. Um, his website is taketillmandown.org. And he, like, it's like a monthly protest. Um, and I think they're pushing to put a, a different uh, statue up, um, but I'm not sure what the story is there. But I did want to, like, plug that and say he, he posts his dates up on his website. Well, that's fantastic. And I'm glad you mentioned that. I the statue, in case you're not familiar, there is a statue of Tillman on the state house grounds. Um, I'll show you a picture of it right here. Um, it's a, a very prominent statue on the state house grounds. It was installed in 1940, right? And um, Historic Columbia has done some work in recent years to reinterpret the statue and to say. Just be honest about why it's there. Uh, it's not just for the sake of history it's being put up in 1940 to intimidate a certain group of South Carolinians. And, and, and as both a historian as a citizen of this state, I have to say, seeing a statue of Ben Tillman in the State House grounds is absolutely infuriating because 
when you think about what Tillman did as both governor and senator from South Carolina, especially as governor, this was a man who encouraged lynchings. This was a man who came to power because he participated in the destruction of Reconstruction. And he was an individual who pushed through a constitution which stripped the right to vote from tens of thousands of citizens of this state. And yet, even right now, he has a statue on the state house grounds. We have a statue of Richard Breeder at the University of South Carolina now, the first, first PhD, first black professor that uh, Dr. Christian uh, Anderson there would have had a, a large role in seeing it happen. First uh, black graduate of Harvard, first black professor at USC, attended the law school um, at USC while he was also teaching. And he was the first labor, uh, black librarian too, because he served as librarian for the better part of the year. What year did he teach? 1873 to 1877. But so when the university was closed, he and all of the other faculty were kicked out. And this is uh, the, the website. Just wanted to give it a plug as well. Uh, take Tillman down. Um, again, to, to say that he was a racist, a white supremacist, and a terrorist is not an exaggeration. Simply describing his record. Mm -hmm. I was at a conference uh, on, on the 150th anniversary of uh, the Morrill Act. And we had various presentations about land grant universities in, in, each, in, in various states, and I did South Carolina. And I wasn't talking, I mean, I wasn't emphasizing Tillman's racism, white supremacy, but I just said, you know, here's his role in the founding of Clemson, and just mentioned he's a white supremacist, and da, da, da. firsthand during Q&A, as someone who says, well, I think, you know, he had some racially insensitive thoughts, <laughs> but I don't know that I'd classify him as a white supremacist. <laughs> and luckily I was well armed. I said, look, I can read you from his own speeches. And if you want to call that anything other than white supremacy, you've got a lot of explaining to do. And that pretty much yeah, closed that down. People don't understand that it was legal to be a white supremacist. Right. Up until I graduated from high school. Still is legal. Seriously. Yeah. And so that, that, that tendency to lean right is it been, has been built into the laws here for generations. He was racially insensitive. Yes, racial modern <laughs> Yes, go ahead, please, sir. Can you speak a little bit more about Hubert Harrison? I haven't heard of him before. Oh, yeah. I was kind of intrigued about it. I only want to be here tonight, I guess. <laughs> no, so so Hubert Harrison, Hubert Harrison is one of the reasons I mentioned him this evening is that he provides a critique of American socialism and the American left that is still relevant today in terms of how do you situate class and race and combine it as like a, a whole a holistic critique of American capitalism and the like. But Harrison is also important because uh, he was one of the most prominent Black intellectuals of his day, 19 teens and 20s. He was actually one of the early masters of the book review in terms of writing book reviews and giving detailed accounts of books and how, why they're important, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Uh, he also became a initially a prominent supporter and then critic of Marcus Garvey. Uh, Marcus Garvey, when he creates the uh, Universal Negro Improvement Association and creates the Negro World newspaper, Hubert Harrison is actually the editor of that newspaper for several years. He's actually the one who gets it off the ground, makes it what it is. And then Harrison leaves because he believed that Garvey was too race-centric, and also felt that Garvey was just not a good leader. Was Garvey a what? Was not a good leader. He, th he thought Garvey was actually a megalomaniac in some way. Which was a bit of a uh, grifter. <laughs> well, yeah, that, there's that. Like, Harrison kind of saw that coming in a lot of ways. <laughs> and so Harrison leaves the Negro World newspaper and, and founds his own newspaper instead. Uh, one other thing about Harrison, too, is that he's also very critical of W.B. Du Bois. Um, in particular, because of Du Bois' support for the war. Uh, and I, 
Mm-hmm. One of my book recommendations I sent out this week is about is a story book by Chad Williams called The Wounded World, W.E.B. Du Bois and the Great War. And when Du Bois comes out in support of the war effort in 1917, saying that Black people should close ranks, forget our special grievances, et cetera, he is heavily criticized by other Black leaders for doing that. One of the reasons is that Hubert Harrison reveals that Du Bois was trying to get a commission in the U.S. Army as an intelligence officer while writing that. And so he was trying to get involved in the war effort directly. He has to kind of backtrack in 1918. And this leads to um, Harrison and other younger activists really criticizing Du Bois throughout the course of the war. That ultimately leads to Du Bois himself in 1919 going to France and interviewing Black soldiers and gave their testimonies about what they experienced in the war. And what he finds is horrifying, that they're, they're experiencing rampant racism on the front lines from American generals and American officers and the like. And they're often being accused of trumped up charges, being, being disproportionately court-martialed, et cetera. Du Bois assembles this evidence. He has, at one point, he writes over 800 pages about what he sees in France and never publishes it. And we think he never published it because it broke his heart that he basically got played into supporting the war effort. But Harrison kind of kept his feet to the fire the entire time. And um, Harrison, and today there's more being written about Hubert Harrison, um, but he's one of those folks who, in terms of the history of the Black left in particular, before you have Cornell West or a Huey Newton or um, all those people, you have a Hubert Harris who is providing an example, talking about race and class in a, in a more nuanced manner than we're kind of used to. Thanks. Any other questions? Not about white powdery substances. <laughs> It's not a fully far question, but you were talking about how SC law and um, laws in the U.S. showed worldwide like white supremacy. You brought up the map of Africa in yes. 1914, mm-hmm. and you said the only independent places were Algeria, no, uh, Liberia, and Ethiopia. Okay, Liberia and Ethiopia. Okay. Um, and then you said that you showed that in the Spanish American War. The U.S. defeated Spain and took more land over the sea. You said it was Cuba and the Philippines that they took. The Philippines and Puerto Rico, Cuba, the U.S. didn't formally take. Okay. We let them have independence because we basically the argument was we fought the war for Cuba's independence, so we couldn't directly conquer it, but we had indirect control through the governments of Cuba and that sort of thing for decades. Okay. Thank you. You have a question. You mentioned uh, going into the Constitution of 1895 a little bit more, or is there, I mean, I, I, that, that's such a rabbit hole, I hesitate to even bring it up. No, we, we covered it in, in more detail last week, okay. uh, but what I do want to do real quick is, one of the things about that Constitution that's worth noting this evening, uh, two things. Number one, like the other Southern state constitutions, and let me pull up Oh, here we are. Like the other state constitutions in the South in the 1890s and early 1900s, their objective was very clear. They were trying to restrict vote, Black voting rights as much as they possibly could while staying constitutionally aware and staying basically under the law of the Constitution. So they couldn't outright say, we are stripping Black folk of the right to vote. What they could do was introduce things like uh, literacy tests, for example, uh, which, again, these, these rules disenfranchise a lot of poor whites as well. Introduce literacy tests. Uh, the poll tax is particularly devastating uh, in, uh, throughout the South, not just South Carolina. And with the 1895 Constitution, what you also see is that they include provisions about owning a certain amount of property and able to participate in the voting process. Uh, You also would lose your right to vote if you were accused of certain crimes like bigamy, burglary, arson, or robbery. 
So when you think about contemporary debates over granting the right to vote to people who were convicted of felonies and that kind of thing, that start, starts in the post-Reconstruction period. Uh, but perhaps the most important part of this is that you have to pay your poll tax at least six months prior to the election itself. And as I pointed out last class, that six month period was usually around the time when you're starting to sell crops to market, when you're finding out, is this going to support my family for the year or not? And so when you're thinking about that and also paying your poll tax, it was often a question of, I can pay my poll tax or feed my family. I can't do both. Um, and so these are just some of the most important provisions of that constitution of 1895. Uh, what is also worth noting here really quickly is that when Tillman calls for this convention to create a new constitution, he is doing so despite the fact that within the Democratic Party of South Carolina, there's a, there's a big divide between the Tillmanites and the so-called conservatives who... They, they both want the same thing of restricting Black voting rights. Where they disagree is how much collateral damage can be done to white voters at the same time. And ultimately what happens is the Constitution of 1895 also disenfranchises a lot of white voters too. And Tillman admits like that's going to happen. That's the price of doing business. Yeah. You have any other questions about the Constitution of 1895? No, uh, I was just sort of tracking along with today where you were highlighting, the, um, I, I, I imagine it was pretty consistent all throughout Reconstruction, but especially around 1898, seems to be a lot of, uh, I, I know from some personal history, uh, Phoenix, South Carolina, there was mm. some, some uh, election suppression, you know, uh, race, massacres going on there so well and, and one of the tragedies of this era is that every state in the south has histories of race massacres so-called race riots and the like um too many quite frankly to discuss even a semester full of classes nicole i see your hand is raised yes um I was wondering, um, because, man, I, it has been amended, the, okay, about the Constitution of 1895. It's been amended so many times, and um, it's a long, convoluted document. Do you have any idea why no one has just decided, let's start over? Let's, let's see what we can do with this. Nicole, we've been talking about that for 50 years. Our concern is if you put it to a vote, they bring slavery back. <laughs> I need to remind you that it was it wasn't until 1969 that women got you know juries. It wasn't until 2000 that they we had we voted to take miscegenation. Uh, I, I couldn't when I went to register to vote in 1969. I had to pledge that I was that I was not a miscegenist, that I didn't have a, in a relationship with people who never raised. And I asked the registrar, Mr. Peoples, do you mean I practice it or I advocate it? And he called the police. <laughs> in 2036% of the people voted to keep it in. So give us a little more time before you call that constitutional behavior. Call, please. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> yes. Are there any projects um, that are solely focused on identifying people who are in lynching photos? Oh. Now, that's an interesting question. So, repeat the question. Okay, so that question was Are there any projects underway to identify the people that you see in lynching photos, like the crowds and that sort of thing? I'm not 100% sure if there is or not. Um, I can tell you that in recent years, of course, you have the Equal Justice Initiatives, yes. a lynching museum in Alabama. But in terms of identifying the people in those photographs, I don't know if there is one or not underway. I'll look and see, because it wouldn't surprise me if there was. That would be a, a massive undertaking, but a very interesting one yeah. as well. With, you know, with 
all the tech advances and everything else, I feel like that should some of the effort that will go into that probably will decrease over the next couple of years. Right. Yes. Um, where do you see the transition from the more overt public? We're gonna show our faces as we're doing this violence to the more covert version that that would come. And and what were the sort of influences that that made that shift? That it's a brief period in history. I mean, I this is I'm I have got this theory now about we're entering another era that where hypocrisy is dead. That we now have a guy that's running for president, an overt white nationalist. And that when I was growing up, and certainly when Tillman was there, it was legal to be a white nationalist racist. And I, I forget that myself. And I know that, that it's not something where we're shocked about people's attitudes, that we've got to remember that it was it was the law. And so I'm not suggesting that makes it right. I'm just suggesting that makes it more dangerous. That's what it is. But that I, I've seen this period, see, it was 1970 before there were black elected officials in South Carolina. There may have been one or two locally, but there were none in the state house. And that, I mean, I was at the University of South Carolina. But there was a there, there was a period, say between 70 and um 2002, maybe, where there was this transition from the white supremacists being the Democrats to the white supremacists being the Republicans. And it took a very short period of time. And now we're seeing the dropping of the pretext and that hypocrisy is no longer necessary to be able to win elections. You can be a white racist. But I have no idea, Josh, if that answers your, anything close to your question. Maybe. I don't know. Was... Well, I think going back to your question too, um, another way to look at it in terms of uh, the late 19th century is that you go from having the Ku Klux Klan in the 1870s, where they're wearing masks and everything, mm. to within like a, a handful of years, by 1875, 76, 77, you have people in Mississippi and the Carolinas trying to overthrow city and state governments through naked force and through voter intimidation without wearing any masks whatsoever. Mm. What that shows is that there was just a loss of federal support for fighting against these actions, right? You have President Grant in 1870-71 vigorously pursuing the Ku Klux Klan in South Carolina. By 1876, his hands are tied with the Hamburg Massacre in South Carolina, right? Um, and I think going a bit further than that, we talk about lynchings and the like in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. What you're really seeing is you're going from the federal government and most white northerners just acquiescing to racism to really either acquiescing to it or being actively supportive of it. Um, like I mentioned before, the dream of reconstruction, the dream of a multiracial republic was on life support by the early 20th century. All right. I, I want to <laughs> say something that's relevant to the type of studies that we're doing about the past and knowing when to ask questions and regretting that you didn't get to ask them. The understanding that Du Bois, we, I, I heard more about Du Bois's angst about being in favor of the war. Majeska was a, 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 a friend of Du Bois from the time her mother joined the Niagara Movement with Du Bois in 1905. Du Bois was the keynote speaker of this conference that Majeska hosted in Columbia, South Carolina in 1946. That's like 50 year difference. That we printed at the Harbinger IWW print shop this, this card, it's a greeting card from Majesta. Her hero was Eugene Debs, who spent time in prison for refusing to go to the war. And the card says, Father is a lower class, I am in it. Father is a criminal element, I am of it. And while there is a soul in prison, I am not free. Eugene Debs. And that's what she wanted on her greeting card. And so that's, I wish I had known to ask that question of her. But I think that we have, all have to be open to receiving new data that puts nuances on people. Ben Tillman was a great agricultural fan who did things that I do and I, I know my wife does when no one's looking, of picking a leaf or something off of a plant. He did this in the botanical gardens in Washington. If you want to have a meeting with Tillman, 
he would take you to the botanical, beautiful botanical gardens outside the capital. And, and that's where he would like put stuff in his pockets and take it back to Edgefield and plant it. I like that about a guy. Not that he's probably the, you know, the dictionary picture next to the white supremacist, but being able to understand that, that, that this monster nation, make this monster image that we put on people that are evil inhibits us from understanding that potential in others. And we need to be more perceptive than that. So that's my final word for you. Well, and on that note, remember this Sunday, we have a, a deeper dive with Carrie Taylor from the Citadel about labor activism in the South during the Great Depression. And next Monday, we'll be getting deeper into the human rights struggle during the Great Depression in the World War II years that really changes the state, the nation, and the entire world. So just a few small topics are coming. Up. On that note, you guys have a wonderful Monday evening. Enjoy the rest of Jackie Robinson Day, and I will see you all next Sunday and Monday. Thank you. Thank you.